Hello, I'm Kieran Callahan, and welcome to the Engineering and Technology Teachers Association podcast on the prescribed topic for the Leaving Cert 2014, Basic Principles of Operation of Nuclear Power Plants. Now, the graphic currently running on your screen shows the core, or the essence, of how nuclear power is generated. And if you don't understand what's happening there, don't worry, by the end of this podcast, you should have a very clear idea of exactly what's happening there. So, to move on, if we look at some of the things you may already know about a nuclear power plant, some may have a very good grounding in factual knowledge, some people may have no idea of how a nuclear power plant works, or indeed have been given false information about the potential safety issues around a nuclear power plant. So, to look at one of the more common exposures we have to nuclear power plants, This happy little elf game is so stupid. You tap and wait and tap and wait. And for what? So your pretend town can have more pretend flowers than your pretend friends? What a colossal waste of time. Hey, what if I buy a bushel barrel full of elf berries? (laughs) That should speed things up. I spent a thousand dollars? Oh well, I'll just tell them that my kid did it and get a refund. Uh oh. Now there are a lot of things factually wrong with what Homer has just been doing in his nuclear power plant. First of all, nuclear power plant operators are not allowed to play with their iPads when they're operating a nuclear reactor. And secondly, nuclear power plants cannot physically explode in the way that was just shown in the previous clip. That is physically impossible. They can melt down under certain situations, but they cannot explode. If we look at one of the common images we see of the nuclear power plant from The Simpsons, we can see that it doesn't portray a very good image. We can see a three-headed fish who's mutated. We can see a geeky professor walking along the back railing. We can see billows of smoke coming from the top of two chimneys, which are glowing red hot. And we can also see nuclear waste spilling around the course of the river as it flows along the front of the screen there. To begin to look at nuclear power plants, we need to set out some clear objectives. What do we want to know about nuclear power plants? The basic objectives to find out What is nuclear power? From a brief history of how it was formed to how it's used in modern days. We need to find out how is it different from other sources of power plants. How does the nuclear power plant itself work? Which involves finding out the basic principles of nuclear fission. To look at the advantages and disadvantages over other power generation systems and to finish off looking at some terminology used in nuclear power plants. If we look at power plants and power stations themselves, what is the primary function? A power station is a facility built to generate large amounts of electrical power for supply to homes, schools, businesses and industry. How does it actually achieve that? At the heart of all power stations is a generator. A generator converts kinetic energy from a rotating shaft into electrical energy. This is done by spinning coils of wire in a magnetic field. What do power stations have in common? A very, very simple process. Fuel is used to create heat. Heat is used to create steam. The pressure from the steam is used to turn a turbine, and the turbine is used to turn the generator and create the electricity. How does a nuclear plant differ? In gas, peat, coal or oil power stations, fossil fuels are burned to release heat energy. In a nuclear station, fuel is not burned but the heat is released in huge quantities through chemical reactions in a controlled environment. The background to nuclear power. In 1939, a German scientist called Otto Hahn 
discovered that by breaking up the nucleus of a uranium-235 atom into two parts, it releases 200 million times the energy of the neutron that triggered it. Along with his colleagues, Lisa Meitner and Fritz Stratzman, he found that when the nucleus of a uranium-235 isotope was bombarded with neutrons, it will absorb one of those neutrons. This results in a highly unstable compound nucleus, which then splits into two parts. This process is called nuclear fission. In the photograph on screen, you can see a picture of Otto Hahn himself, and at the bottom of the screen, you can see a German postage stamp from 1944 commemorating Otto Hahn's discovery of nuclear fission and commemorating the Nobel Prize for Chemistry that he received that year. At first, the entire focus of nuclear technology was for military use. But after World War II ended and research into nuclear expanded, the idea of using nuclear technology to provide energy became more common, with the USA, Great Britain, France and the USSR governments beginning nuclear programs. Calder Hall was the world's first nuclear power station to provide electricity in commercial quantities. The plant was officially opened by Queen Elizabeth II on the 17th of October 1956. When the station finally closed on the 31st of March 2003, the first reactor had been in use for almost 47 years. Calder Hall is now the site of what is the Sellafield complex on the west coast of Cumbria. In its early life, it was primarily used to produce weapons-grade plutonium. It produced two fuel loads per year, and early electricity production was just a secondary purpose. From 1964, it was mainly used on commercial fuel loads, and in April 1995, the UK government announced that all production of plutonium for weapons purposes had ceased. So to look at some common features of a nuclear power plant. First of all, the reactor is common to every nuclear power plant. Most power plants have a steam generator, although the boiling water type reactor does not need to use one of them. Turbines are common to drive the generators. Condensers or coolers are also common to every nuclear power plant. Every plant needs a way of cooling down the water. Cooling towers are commonly used although some plants are located beside the sea, so the seawater can be used as a source of cooling, and therefore cooling towers are not always needed. Containment buildings are used to shield the reactor, and every nuclear power plant must have a backup power supply in case the reactor or generators fail. So to look at those in a bit more depth, there we have a picture of the reactor itself. We can see it has a pressure vessel, it has a core, with the word moderator written underneath in brackets, we'll talk what that is in a few minutes, and it has control rods which can slide in and out of the reactor. So what is the reactor itself? The nuclear reactor is a device to initiate and control a sustained nuclear chain reaction. Heat from nuclear fission is passed to a working fluid which can be water or gas, which runs through the turbines. Some reactors are used to produce isotopes for medical and industrial use or for the production of plutonium for weapons, as the initial reactor at Calder Hall was used for many years. Steam generators are not used in boiling water reactors, but they are used in every other type of reactor. Steam generators are heat exchangers used to convert water into steam from the heat produced in the reactor core. They are used in pressurized water reactors between the primary and secondary coolant loops. The water flowing through the steam generator boils the water on the shell side to produce steam in the secondary loop that is delivered to the turbines to make electricity. The steam is subsequently condensed and returned to the steam generator to be heated once again. These loops have an important safety role 
because they constitute one of the primary barriers between the radioactive and non-radioactive sides of the plant. During scheduled maintenance outages or shutdowns, the steam generator tubes are inspected by non-destructive testing, normally eddy current testing. If we look at the graphic on the right hand side of the screen, we can see that the layout of the steam generator is very, very, very similar to the layout of the heat exchanger in the copper tank in your hot press at home. You may be familiar with how this works if you have studied your construction studies course in plumbing. The basic idea is that heat from the boiler, or from the reactor in this case, passes through a heat exchanger inside in the tank. The water flowing past the heat exchanger can absorb the heat without ever actually mixing with the water moving through the heat exchanger itself. This is a vitally important safety role and it ensures that the radioactive water or gas coming from the reactor can heat the water going to the turbines without ever actually touching the water or touching the turbines themselves. So moving on to look at the turbines themselves. The steam turbine is the device that extracts the energy from the pressurized steam and uses it to do mechanical work on the rotating shaft. Because the turbine generates rotary motion, it is particularly suited to be used to drive an electrical generator. The steam turbine is a form of heat engine that derives much of its efficiency from the use of multiple stages in the expansion of steam. To maximise the efficiency, the steam is expanded doing work in a number of stages. So what does that mean? Well, if we look at the graphic on the left-hand side of your screen, you can see that the turbines are massive. These things are huge. To generate maximum power from the steam available, they do that in a number of stages. Most turbines typically have three or four different size blades in them. The first blade is around about the length of your finger. That extracts the initial surge of pressure from the steam. Steam hits that at around about 165 bar. That's about 2,500 PSI. And if you think that the pressure in the tyres of your car are around about 30 PSI, you can get an idea of how much pressure hits those blades. As it passes through, some of the pressure is used to turn the turbine. The next stage of blade is run about the length of your hand, and the last blades there, as you can see from the picture, are run about the length of your leg. When the steam is passed on through the turbines, its next step on its journey is the condenser. The condenser is a device that's used to condense the steam from its gas state back into water in a liquid state. This is done by cooling it. In doing so, the heat given up by the steam is being used and transferred to the coolant. This means it must be cooled. Cooling the water is normally done by the air in a cooling tower, or it can also be done by seawater if the nuclear power plant is located close to the sea. The graphic on the right hand side of your screen is a photograph of a typical condenser in a nuclear power plant. So looking at cooling the water in the cooling loop. Typically they are cooling towers. The cooling tower is used to transfer the heat from the condenser coolant to the air. They work by natural updrafts of air in the venturi created by the parabolic shape. Some nuclear power plants are deliberately built close to the sea, as we've already said, because their large supply of water can be used as a coolant, and therefore they don't need these massive cooling towers. From the graphic, we can see the non-radioactive warm water coming from the condenser and being sprayed into a collecting basin in the bottom of the cooling tower. From there, it is cooled by the air and it returns to the condenser to help condense the steam back down into water to be heated again in the steam generator. The air that passes through the voids in the bottom of the cooling tower absorbs heat from the water spray and as it rises, it's drawn up 
by the natural currents of air caused by the shape of the cooling tower. What leaves the top of the cooling tower is non-radioactive water vapour. This non-radioactive water vapour, or steam, is not harmful in any way. So moving on to look inside the containment building itself. The containment building is typically an airtight steel structure enclosing the reactor and it's normally sealed off from the outside atmosphere. The steel is either freestanding or attached to a concrete missile shield. It is designed to fully withstand the impact of a loaded passenger airliner without rupture or exposing the core of the nuclear reactor to the air and the natural environment. If we look at the graphic here, we can see that the shield building itself is anywhere from 3 to 4 feet of steel reinforced concrete. The steel containment vessel itself is 2 inches of thick metal plate. Inside that, there is up to 7 feet of concrete shielding, and in the reactor vessel itself, it has 8 to 9 inch thick steel plating covering up the reactor and keeping all the reactions enclosed and safe from exposure to the environment. The last feature common to every nuclear power plant is the backup power supply. This is one of the primary safety systems. They are a required feature in nuclear power plants. They are usually diesel power generators which provide power for all the control and cooling systems to operate the plant should the main power fail. They are typically installed in sets of three. That means that if any one goes down, two are available to back up the power. And interesting to note, the meltdown at the Fukushima nuclear plant in 2011 was caused by a failure of the backup power when the room containing the diesel engines was flooded by the tsunami that came after the earthquake. So moving on to see how the nuclear power plant actually creates electricity using the energy that's released from the atoms inside the uranium. To do that, we must look at the structure of matter itself. From your science at Junior Cert, you will know that every atom has the same basic structure. We can see the graphic here on the right hand side shows us that the nucleus is made up of protons and neutrons and around the nucleus of the atom we have a cloud of electrons orbiting. The arrangement of the protons and neutrons gives every element its properties. And from science again, the periodic table lists all the atomic elements based on their atomic weight. So if we have a quick look at our periodic table of the elements, we can see the typical ones that we're familiar with. Hydrogen, helium, lithium, beryllium and all the other ones that we were made learn of for science at Junior Cert. The ones we were interested in for our nuclear reactor are the elements down here at the bottom of the periodic table. We can see that many of these have the nuclear symbol beside them, the symbol for radioactivity. So, what else exactly does that mean? Let's have a little look at a video of the inside of the atom and see what's happening there. Here we have the periodic table of the elements, and an element we're very much used to seeing. The oxygen element, there is its atom and its electrons floating around its shell. If we look at the core of the atom, it has 8 protons, 8 neutrons and 8 electrons. This gives it an atomic mass of 16, as indicated on the top right hand side of the screen. This is a view of what those electrons look like spinning around in real terms. If we go back and we look at the uranium atom, we can see it has an atomic mass of 238. The uranium atom is highly unstable. It is radioactive. This means it is continually spitting out neutrons and protons, trying to become stable. As you can see on the top right hand side of the screen, it goes through various different atomic weights and various different elements as it tries to become stable. An example of this is radon, which you may be familiar with from your construction studies course. Eventually, when enough protons and neutrons have been shed, the atom will settle 
in the stable form of lead with an atomic weight of 206 and an atomic number of 82. If we take one atom of uranium isotope, isotope means the type of atomic structure that it is. That means how many protons and neutrons are in its core. Each different structure with different numbers of protons and neutrons is called an isotope. The one we're going to look at has 235 neutrons in its core. This is often simply called uranium-235 or U-235. So, the nucleus of this uranium-235 atom is bombarded with neutrons. As these neutrons pass by, one of them is absorbed into the core of the atom. This changes the structure of the atom, and it now becomes a compound nucleus. By adding on this one neutron to its structure, it has now become very, very, very unstable. It has gone from being uranium-235 to the highly unstable uranium-236. Because it's now so unstable, that last little neutron becomes the straw that broke the camel's back, and the core of the atom tears itself in two. It's so unstable, it becomes unable to maintain its structure, and the nucleus splits, forming two small atoms and releasing a huge amount of energy. In fact, the amount of energy that's released when the atom splits in two is 200 million times greater than the charge that the neutron, which originally was added, was carrying. This energy that's released is in the form of heat, and that heat we can use to boil the water, create the steam, and drive the turbines. So, when this atom splits, what actually happens, which causes it to keep going, is that as the uranium-236 isotope splits, it forms two other elements. Originally, it had 92 protons. 56 of those and 141 neutrons form the element barium, while the other 36 protons and 92 neutrons form krypton. And those of you who are pretty sharp on maths will have added up 141 and 92 and discovered that there are three neutrons missing. Those three neutrons are released as free neutrons, and each one of those is available to hit another uranium-235 atom and trigger another nuclear fission. So, to put that in real terms, there we have a graphic illustrating exactly what's happening and the chemical equation of nuclear fission underneath. In other words, one neutron plus a uranium-235 atom join together to form the unstable uranium-236. The uranium-236 splits to form barium, krypton, and three free neutrons, plus, what's important from a nuclear point of view, an incredible amount of energy, labelled as Q. So, as these three neutrons are released, as we said on the previous slide, every nuclear fission reaction produces three more neutrons, which means that a chain reaction of nuclear fission can occur. One neutron releases three neutrons, three neutrons hit three atoms and release nine neutrons, nine neutrons hit nine atoms, release 27 neutrons, and so on and so forth. The chain reaction keeps growing and growing and growing to the power of three. This is called an exponential increase in the amount of energy released by the reactor. So, a big problem is controlling this chain reaction. If the chain reaction runs away, massive power surges will occur in the reactor and it will melt down. So to control the amount of reactions, there are two main methods. First of all, a moderator, which we saw on the graphic of the nuclear reactor earlier on, the moderator is a material to slow down the neutrons. Normally, it is water or graphite. The second way of controlling the reactions is to have control rods. So, the moderator itself. The moderator, as we said, can be water or carbon dioxide, or sometimes graphite. 
the function of the moderator is to slow down the neutron speed and stabilize the amount of reactions. Shown in the image on screen here is the water used as a moderator in a cooling pond in Fukushima. The cooling pond is where the used fuel from the reactor is stored. As the neutrons from this highly radioactive spent fuel pass through into the water, they are slowed down and the effect of those neutrons travelling through the water can be seen as a blue glow. So looking at the other ways of controlling the reactions, the control rods themselves are the main method that the nuclear reactor operator has for controlling the power output of the reactor. The control rods are made from a neutron absorbing material, normally graphite. Lowering the rods into the reactor absorbs neutrons and stops the fission. Removing the rods increases the rate of fission. So the control rods act like the accelerator on a car. As you can see on the graphic on the right hand side, lifting the control rods out allows more nuclear fission reactions to take place and therefore increases the power output of the reactor. Pushing the control rods in slows down the reactions of fission and therefore the reactor produces less power. And all nuclear reactors are designed so that in an emergency inserting all control rods will completely stop the fission within two seconds. So moving on to look at some of the common types of nuclear reactor. Now there are many many variants of reactor operational in the world. There are over 400 nuclear power plants. Some of the more common types of reactor are the boiling water reactor or the BWR, the pressurized reactor the PWR, or an advanced gas cooled reactor which is an AGR. So looking at the simpler type, the boiling water reactor now, as we can see, the boiling water reactor is a very, very simple setup as nuclear power plants go. There are two loops. A primary loop where water passes through the nuclear reactor vessel, is heated till it boils, turns into high pressure steam, leaves the reactor, the pressure of the steam hits a turbine and causes it to turn. The turbine turns the generator creates the electricity which travels through the pylons, down the wires and powers homes, schools and businesses. When the steam leaves the turbine it passes through a cooling loop where it's condensed back into water and is pumped back through the reactor to be heated into steam once again. While this is a very very simple layout it does have an incredible disadvantage in that if any of the components outside the containment structure rupture, for example the pipes go into the turbines, back through the condenser or back into the reactor again, radioactive steam will be released into the environment. Also, because the steam passing through the turbines and pipes is highly radioactive, it means that they will decay further, faster and will also be harder to dispose of. So looking at the text of that, the boiling water reactor is the second most common type of electricity generating nuclear reactor after the pressurized water reactor. So the BWR is the second most common type after the PWR or the pressurized water reactor. In the boiling water reactor, the reactor core heats the water which turns to steam and then drives the steam turbine. Boiling water reactor uses demineralized water as a coolant and neutron moderator. The water itself in the reactor is the moderator for slowing down the neutrons. Heat is produced by the nuclear fission in the reactor core and this causes the cooling water to boil producing steam. The steam as we saw in the diagram is directly used to drive the turbine after which it's cooled in the condenser and converted back to liquid water. This water is then returned to the reactor core as we saw in the diagram completing the primary loop. The main advantage of the boiling water reactor is that it has fewer parts and its reactor operates at a lower temperature since the water is boiled in there. However, 
This causes safety issues, as we saw again in the diagram, in that water and high pressure steam are mixed in the reactor. This means that you have liquid and gas passing through the reactor. Also of issue is the fact that the turbines and condenser are exposed to the radioactive steam. So a much more advanced version of reactor is the pressurised water reactor. As we can see in the diagram on screen now, it has introduced a completely separate loop to keep all the radioactive water and steam inside in the containment structure. This means that the reactor can run hotter and it also means that the power output can be much greater. So when this primary loop is heated in the reactor, it then moves on and in the steam generator, non-radioactive water absorbs heat from the heat exchanger. The water is boiled and turns to steam. The steam passes through to the turbine, down through the condenser and back into the steam generator again. It's very important to note here that all the water from the steam generator on is non-radioactive. As we look at our screen, everything to the left hand side of the steam generator is radioactive and everything outside the containment structure is non-radioactive. This means the parts can last longer and they are also safer. So we have the primary loop which passes through the reactor. It's coloured in yellow and orange. We have the secondary loop which carries water through the steam generator, down through the turbines, through the condenser where the steam is turned back into water and back into the steam generator again. That's the secondary loop. And finally we have a third loop which is the cooling loop where water is pumped either from the cooling towers or from the sea into the condenser to help turn the steam back into water and it passes back through to be cooled again. So we have three separate loops. The primary loop at the reactor, the secondary loop from the steam generator to the turbines to the condenser and then the cooling loop. So, the theory on that, the pressurised water reactors constitute the majority of all modern nuclear power plants. They're very, very similar to the boiling water reactors, except that the pressurised water reactor introduced a steam generator. This isolates the radioactive parts of the plant from the rest of the plant, and by that we mean the turbines, generators, condensers, etc. So, the theory on that, the pressurised water reactors constitute the majority of all modern nuclear power plants. They're very, very similar to the boiling water reactors, except that the pressurised water reactor introduced a steam generator. This isolates the radioactive parts of the plant from the rest of the plant, and by that we mean the turbines, generators, condensers, etc. This means that the pressurised water reactor is much safer. So in the pressurised water reactor, the primary coolant, the water, is pumped under high pressure to the reactor core where it's heated by the energy generated by the fission of atoms. The heated water then flows to a steam generator where it transfers its thermal energy to a secondary loop where steam is generated and flows to the turbines, which in turn spin an electric generator. In contrast to the boiling water reactor, pressure in the primary coolant loop prevents the water from boiling within the reactor. Pressurised water reactors use ordinary water as both coolant and neutron moderator. The water in the reactor is pressurised so that it will not boil, as we've said in the previous slide, similar to the coolant in the engine of a typical car. This means that the reactor can run hotter with more power output and not have the risk of a steam explosion in its core, unlike the boiling water reactor. The main disadvantage of this type of equipment is that it is much more complex. It has more parts and therefore is much more expensive than a similar boiling water reactor. So let's have a quick look at one of these reactors in action. A pressurized water reactor power plant comprises a nuclear island with buildings that house specific equipment. The reactor, nuclear auxiliaries, safeguard systems, 
fuel and diesel generators. The plant also includes a conventional island with a turbo generator set which produces electricity. The energy production process begins with the fission of uranium atoms inside the reactor core, which contains nuclear fuel assemblies. Each of these assemblies contains several hundred sealed tubes, each containing pellets of enriched uranium. Enriched because it contains a high proportion of uranium-235, the fissile element. In the process of fission, the collision between a neutron and the nucleus of a uranium-235 atom splits the nucleus into two fragments, ejecting two or three neutrons. These neutrons are free to split other fissile nuclei, thus maintaining a chain reaction which produces high levels of heat within the fuel tubes. These tubes then transfer heat to the primary circuit water, simply by contact. The chain reaction is controlled at all times. Control rods made from neutron absorbing material are lowered into or withdrawn from the core to control the nuclear reaction. In the event of an emergency, the control rods drop by gravity into the core, stopping the chain reaction within two seconds. The primary circuit is a closed circuit of pressurized water whose function is to extract heat from the nuclear reactor. This water enters the reactor vessel at 296 degrees Celsius. It's heated by contact with the fuel assemblies and exits at 327 degrees. The water then passes into a steam generator where it transfers its heat to a secondary water circuit. Water in the primary circuit is pumped through the various components. To assure that water in the primary circuit remains in a liquid state, a pressurizer maintains the constant level of 155 bars. Hence the name, pressurized water reactor. The reactor shown here has four primary loops surrounding the reactor vessel. One of the fundamental features of reactor safety is the interposition of three successive sealed barriers between the radioactive products and the environment. The fuel assembly tubes, the metal containment of the primary circuit, the concrete containment building. Within the steam generator, heat stored in the primary circuit water is transferred to a secondary circuit. The heat exchange occurs within a bundle of around 6,000 inverted U-shaped tubes. The heated water enters the bottom of the steam generator, transfers its heat to the secondary system water through the U-tubes, then returns to the reactor vessel for a new cycle. Water in the secondary circuit flowing around the wrapper of the U-tube bundle is heated to boiling temperature, turns into steam, and then travels to the turbine set in an adjacent building. After passing through the turbine, the steam is recondensed into liquid water and returned to the steam generator for another cycle. Steam pressure from the secondary circuit drives the turbo generators to produce electricity. Secondary circuit water is cooled by a third circuit which can be sea or river water. The condenser uses water pumped from outside the power station to cool the secondary circuit. To summarize, a nuclear power station is essentially three circuits, the primary and secondary circuits, which are both closed, and the cooling circuit, which opens to the exterior. All three work together to transform the energy liberated by nuclear fission into electricity. 
Harnessing the proven and optimized technology of pressurized water reactors enables us to meet the energy needs of society in a most efficient and safe manner. So moving on to look at the other type of nuclear reactor, the advanced gas reactor. The advanced gas reactor is exclusive to the UK. They were designed and built custom made in the UK. They are not found in any other country in the world. The advanced gas reactor is very, very similar in operation to a pressurized water reactor apart from the fact that it uses carbon dioxide gas, which is pressurized, as its primary coolant loop and also as its moderator. Graphite is also used in the reactor as a moderator to control the fission reactions. If we look at the diagram, we can see that the reactor, shown here with a blue outline on the left-hand side of the screen, has carbon dioxide gas pumped around it. Because this is a gas, it means that the reactor can run hotter. There is no danger of it changing phase. That means going from a liquid to a gas, as would happen with water. Therefore, this reactor can have a higher thermal output. It can run much hotter. They typically run at around about 700 degrees Celsius. On the diagram, labelled number 7, on the sides of the reactor, we can see the heat exchanger transferring the heat from the nuclear fission to the secondary loop, which passes through the turbines, labelled number 11, and turning the turbo generator shaft. This turns the generator and generates the electricity. We can also see the cooling loop, and in all the AGR sites, the cooling loop comes from seawater. So on the right-hand side of your diagram, we can see seawater being pumped in through the condenser. It absorbs some of the heat from the steam, which helps it condense back into water, and then it's pumped back out to sea, somewhere in the region of 5 to 6 degrees warmer than it was originally pumped in. So let's have a look at the reactor itself in operation. Here we can see how the carbon dioxide gas is heated as it passes through the reactor. It absorbs heat by contact with the fission that is happening in the fuel bundles. It passes through the heat exchanger on each side, and that allows it to transfer its heat by contact with the tubes in the steam generator there, labelled number 7. That boils the water, turns it into steam, and that steam is sent forward to generate the electricity by turning the turbines. So, to have a quick overview of the AGR, in summary, it is a high temperature reactor. They generally run around about 700 degrees Celsius. The AGR is a higher temperature reactor than the pressurized water reactor. It has a higher thermal efficiency. And it has a high thermal inertia. This means it stores heat at a much higher rate. Its parts are much hotter and that makes it more efficient. As a result, it is slower to respond if there is a fault. When it's cooled down, it is very, very slow to overheat and go into a meltdown situation. It also doesn't need a light water reactor type containment to meet safety targets. Other water reactors do. Bearing in mind we said there was no water in the core, there was carbon dioxide. This means it cannot change its phase. It will not boil and build up pressure like steam would. On the other hand, it does have its disadvantages. It is a very, very, very complex piece of kit. It is virtually hand-built on site, and the refueling plant is also very, very complex. Because these plants were designed and built in the United Kingdom, they are on their own in solving any technical issues which may arise with them. There are some great advantages in that the off-site release is limited because the reactor is low power density. It's 40 times less than a pressurized water reactor, because there is no water in its core. It's a gas. It does have a large thermal mass, which means it can store more heat, because the graphite moderator will absorb much of the heat. And it's probably best advantage over the pressurized water reactor is that the 
primary coolant does not change phase in a fault and by that it means it remains a gas it is always carbon dioxide gas it cannot go from being water and boil and keep boiling into steam building up pressure in the reactor if there is a fault carbon dioxide can be pumped in to preserve a carbon dioxide atmosphere but the coolant cannot change phase this is a massive advantage for safety so moving on to look at one of the biggest issues with nuclear power plants the radiation there are many different types of radiation available in the world today radiation comes from the sun radiation comes from even our own bodies the type of radiation that comes from nuclear fission is ionizing radiation ionizing radiation originates from radioactive materials it's given off by x-rays and it's naturally present in the environment it is invisible and it's not directly detectable by human senses as a result instruments such as a Geiger counter are usually required to detect its presence in some cases it may lead to secondary emission of visible light as seen in the glow from the picture of the spent fuel in the cooling ponds ionizing radiation has many practical uses in medicine for example it's used to sterilize equipment much of the operating equipment in hospitals around the world is sterilized by ionizing radiation it's also used for research and it's used in construction but it does present a health hazard if used improperly exposure to radiation causes damage to living tissue high doses of radiation cause skin burns radiation sickness and even death low but persistent doses of radiation will cause tissue damage resulting in cancer tumors and genetic damage if we look at the graphic towards the bottom of the screen there we can see some of the different types of radiation that are in the world as you can see different layers of protection are available neutrons slow down best in a water environment that's why water is used as moderators and also to keep the spent fuel contained in cooling ponds and prevent the radiation from them escaping into the atmosphere of the building around them without doubt the best known effects of radiation is the 26th of april 1986 an incredibly horrific event occurred involving radiation at a nuclear power plant in chernobyl in the ussr this was the worst nuclear disaster in history it originated as a system test that went horribly wrong many of the safety systems on the reactor were disabled and it was put in a highly unstable configuration after an investigation the operators of the reactor were cleared of any responsibility but the three senior engineers on duty who initiated the test were given 10-year jail sentences an independent report onto it concluded that the cause of the accident was systemic poor management of the plant the graphic on the right hand side of your screen shows a hole that was blown on the roof of the reactor by a pressure build up during the accident occurring if you'd like any more information on this you can view the national geographics seconds from disaster focus on the chernobyl meltdown an extract from that we'll see now Nuclear power promised the Soviet Union a supply of cheap and limitless energy. Chernobyl was the newest of its plants, a triumph of Soviet science. But that changed. In just one hour and 24 minutes, a routine safety test spirals out of control. Thirty-one people die. Hundreds are poisoned, and a toxic cloud spreads as far as Asia and the United States. 6.30 in the morning, April 28th. Two days after the disaster, nuclear engineer Cliff Robinson is driving to work at the Forsmark nuclear power plant in Sweden. It's 1,600 kilometers north of Chernobyl. To enter the site, 
cliff has to pass through a radiation monitor. The alarm went off, indicating that I was contaminated. And it was so strange because I hadn't been into the controlled area of the power station. Cliff is puzzled. He re-enters the radiation monitor, setting off the alarm again and again. He assumes the equipment must be faulty. Then other workers are also prevented entry by the machine. Nobody could go through this monitor because the alarm went off all the time. Radiation is invisible, but Cliff guesses it's the workers' shoes that keep triggering the alarm. And I put it on one of our detectors and started a measurement. And the activity level was just enormous. Cliff is able to work out that the radiation could not be from his plant at Forsmark. The hunt is on to find the source of the contamination. Later that day, Swedish scientists identify the source of the radiation. It's coming from the Soviet Union. They demand an explanation, and the Soviet Union bows to the pressure. It publicly admits to the nuclear accident at Chernobyl. The disaster explodes into front-page news across the world. The press described Chernobyl as an apocalypse. Inside the USSR, the incident gets downplayed, buried under a host of other stories in the day's TV news. An accident has occurred at the Chernobyl atomic power plant. One of the atomic reactors has been damaged. Measures are being undertaken to eliminate the consequences. The victims are being given medical attention and an investigation committee has been set up. This is what the Soviet government tried to cover up. A catastrophic nuclear accident, something the world had never seen before. Reactor 4 at the Chernobyl nuclear power plant had exploded, releasing lethal amounts of radiation into the atmosphere. In this photograph taken by Igor Kostin, radiation can visibly be seen as it contaminates the photographic film within his camera. In this control room, Leonid Toptonov, a young but senior technician, began an experiment which led to an extremely unstable reactor configuration. To this day, many of the switches remain untouched, still in the same position they were the morning of the accident. As the reactor core lay exposed, a plume of highly radioactive smoke continued to rise into the skies. Chernobyl, located 82 miles north of Ukraine's capital city, Kiev, was once a small town located in the far east of the Soviet Union. Nuclear fallout from the explosion was initially spread hundreds of miles, carried by the wind in clouds. Neighboring towns and cities were heavily contaminated. However, nearly 1,000 miles from Chernobyl, Sweden was the first country to detect that something disastrous had happened. The fallout had even reached the United Kingdom. North Wales had been contaminated the worst, and even to this day, 330 hill farms have restrictions on them. The darker orange areas of this map are badly contaminated, and the red areas are severely contaminated with cesium-137, an isotope released into the atmosphere by the reactor explosion. The result was, and still is, devastating. Belarus was by far the worst affected, life-changing effects. Some of these effects are illnesses like thyroid cancer, birth defects like dysplasia, deformation, intellectual disabilities, and 
suffering, and all caused by an invisible force. Chernobyl shaped how the nuclear industry and the world saw nuclear power. It rewrote the safety standards and procedures. Virtually all of the safety standards used in nuclear power plants today are a direct result of the reaction to the horrific events that unfolded at Chernobyl. For any nuclear power plant, they all must have their own fully equipped firefighting teams. Every nuclear power plant must have that. Also, they must have their own medical staff. A mini hospital. They're trained to handle everything from a cut on your finger to a full nuclear disaster on a Chernobyl scale. Also, they have their own armed police force there to protect the plant from anybody who might try to attack it in any way at all. In every plant, there is a consistent emphasis on safety. Safety is the overriding priority on everything that they do. They have extensive and comprehensive fire procedures, again coupled with their own on-site firefighting teams, and the Environmental Protection Agency of each and every nuclear power plant checks the local area, the air, the produce, the ground, the meat, the fish, everything which comes from the area is checked and checked for any signs of radiation from a plant. Other safety issues which come, you may remember seeing packets like the picture indicated here around your house a couple of years ago. They are iodine tablets. If you're unsure, you can ask mum or dad about them. They were issued by the Irish government around about 2002 and they were labelled for use in the event of a nuclear accident. Not many people fully understood exactly what their job was but the iodine which is in them is to stop radiation being ingested into your system. Radiation in the air couldn't damage you unless it was in very high doses. However, radiation in the air, if absorbed into your system by breathing it in to your organs inside, it could affect them. One of the most susceptible to this is the thyroid gland in your throat. Taking these iodine tablets would saturate your thyroid gland with iodine and leave it unsusceptible to absorbing any radiation which might be in the air you are breathing. Other safety standards at nuclear power plants include vacuum chambers, not unlike a slurry tanker for those of you who come from a farming background. Some rooms in the building are kept at negative pressure. If there is a steam leak or any form of radiation leak, by releasing that, it will absorb any air which is released. It is kept at a vacuum. Other safety features include the reinforced concrete on all the reactors. Reinforced concrete is a very, very strong type of shield around the concrete reactor itself. In some of the AGR stations, the reinforced concrete is over 6 metres deep. Also, the flasks for transporting nuclear waste are also highly reinforced. For every one tonne of nuclear waste, the case that transports it weighs over 50 tonnes. New advancements in safety after the Fukushima Daiichi meltdown in 2001 includes gravity activated electromagnetic control rods. If the station loses power, the electromagnet fails and all the control rods will drop into the reactor, shutting it down instantly. Newer reactors also have pressurised coolant. In the event of any breakdown in the reactor, coolant can be injected at high pressure to cool down the reactor. This is combined with coated fuel pellets. These were specifically designed after Fukushima as well. If the temperature in the reactor raises above a certain point, the coating on the pellets will be activated and it will seal the pellets of fuel, allowing no more fission to occur and the pellets will become useless. So let's have a quick look at one of the early tests on safety for nuclear waste. In this crash test in the UK, a train was sent at 160 kilometers an hour into a deliberately derailed nuclear container to see if it could withstand the impact. 
But this would be the final test. The crash looked devastating. But the important thing was that the nuclear container emerged intact. Its strong walls, same was sent at one, simply deflected the kinetic energy. When the impact test was complete, the experts checked the pressure inside and confirmed that there was no significant change. Crash scientists were able to reassure the public that manufacturers had built a container that could withstand the ultimate disaster. So in conclusion, let's just look at a few of the advantages and disadvantages of the nuclear power that we have discussed. On the advantages, coal-fired plants, like this one shown in the picture, emit pollutants that can contribute to climate change, decrease air quality and acid rain. Compared to coal, nuclear power production results in very, very little atmospheric pollution. In 2010, massive fossil fuel emissions brought the air quality in Hong Kong dangerously low. Residents were advised to remain indoors for their own safety. Nuclear power plants don't and won't create smog, like this shown in the picture on the bottom of your screen. Other advantages are while nuclear power plants are somewhat expensive to build, a single facility can provide massive power output for many years. When the picture on the top of your screen was taken in 2000, nuclear power accounted for almost 20% of the lights you can see in the United States. On that note, reliable nuclear technology is already developed. No new innovations are needed to create nuclear reactors that are relatively safe and efficient. We can see in the picture there, one at a university in Japan. Other advantages are that while fossil fuels may be harmful to the environment, they are also a limited resource. Much of our current technology depends on them. Using nuclear power will preserve fossil fuels for airplanes and cars and other machinery which are completely dependent on fossil fuels. Nuclear reactors consume radioactive uranium ore. Like oil or coal, uranium is a limited resource but it appears to be somewhat abundant and estimates of its abundance are on the rise as reactors become more and more efficient. And we can see in the picture there a uranium mine in Canada which is mined to give fuel for nuclear reactors. Some of the last advantages of nuclear plants. One kilogram of uranium can produce heat equivalent to 2.7 million tonnes of coal. It costs around about the same as coal to produce, so this makes it very inexpensive. From the small amounts of uranium, it can produce huge amounts of energy, with very, very little waste. It is reliable and it is stable. It doesn't fluctuate in price or demand. And finally, it can work at full load, 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, unlike pump storage, wind power or wave power. On the other hand, nuclear does have some serious disadvantages. Hopefully, the picture we see there with the yellow barrel of radioactive waste is a fake. Many protesters, like these in Berlin, oppose nuclear power because its production leaves behind a significant amount of dangerous radioactive waste. This radioactive nuclear waste must be sealed underground in protected chambers. The picture shows a former salt mine in Remingen in Germany, which held nuclear waste for decades before structural concerns forced the government to relocate the deadly substances. Here we also see a worker walking through a yard full of nuclear waste. Where will the waste go? The results of nuclear disaster don't just go away. We saw some of the horrific images from Chernobyl, and pictured here, a year after the meltdown at Japan's Fukushima Daiichi nuclear plant, the effects of the disaster are still part of nearby residents' everyday lives. Here, a doctor is preparing a patient for a full-body radiation scan. 
The nuclear reactors run the risk of meltdowns. The worst meltdown in history, as we've already said, was the 1986 meltdown at the Chernobyl nuclear power plant. This photo taken in 2006 shows a Chernobyl sign in the now deserted area. Because of the danger presented by leaked radioactive materials, the nearby town of Pripyat was evacuated after the Chernobyl disaster. Buildings like this preschool still remain abandoned. Around the nuclear power plant, there is a 30 km radius exclusion zone. Experts predict that radioactive contaminants in the Chernobyl area will make the town uninhabitable for centuries. So, in conclusion, some of the terms we came across during our exploration of nuclear power plants include uranium, isotopes, fission, exponential increase, inside in the plant itself we had reactors, steam generators, turbines, generators, cooling towers and condensers. And inside in the reactor operations we had radiation, control rods, the moderator, primary loops and the secondary loop. So, to assess some of the learning we will have done during this exploration of nuclear power plants, we look to our friend from the very beginning, Homer Simpson. That's Homer's response to his nuclear meltdown. So, question time. What is happening in Homer's nuclear reactor? We should know here what the problem he's experiencing is. What's happening inside in his nuclear plant? Question 2. What is the danger if he fails to act fast? What could possibly go wrong with his plant? And lastly, what should he do to bring it under control immediately? So, let's see how you got on. Question 1. What's happening to Homer's nuclear reactor? Homer's nuclear reactor is experiencing a meltdown. This means that the chain reaction of nuclear fission has gone out of control. The reactor core has gone too hot. And question 2. The danger is it may melt down. This means that the heat will cause the fuel cells inside to melt. That may cause an increase in the steam pressure, which may cause a steam explosion with the potential of releasing some harmful radioactive gas into the atmosphere. And lastly, what should you do to bring it under control? Homer should immediately insert all the control rods into the reactor to instantly stop the fission reactions, and he could also increase his coolant flow in his primary circuit to draw heat away from his reactor. And if you've managed to get those three right, you've understood everything that's happened in this exploration of nuclear power, and good on you. Well done. If you are interested in any further reading, some of the references for the information used in this are indicated on your screen now. Lastly, to finish up, in research for this program, one of the main things that was undertaken was a site visit to a nuclear power plant to see and experience firsthand what goes on there. Now, unfortunately, because of security restrictions, I was unable to record anything or take any notes inside the nuclear power plant itself, but I can convey some of the information for you in the following short video. Hello and welcome to the ETTA case study of the Torness Nuclear Power Station. So to begin we'll leave the lovely institute here in Monaghan and we'll travel across to the far side of Scotland, about 30 mile far side of Edinburgh, to the Torness Nuclear Power Station. Now, when going to a power station, what I expected to find was something like this. Perhaps even something a bit more dramatic, like this. But what I actually found was this. A lovely clean power plant, no pylons, no cables, no smoking chimneys. And yes, the field in front there is indeed a field full of grain. So, moving back out from our overview of the power station, out to Torness Pier. Having a wee look back in at the power station from outside, this building houses two nuclear reactors. Each reactor at full capacity produces 640 megawatts of electricity. 
That gives the station a combined output of 1280 megawatts of electricity per hour. It's amazing to note that even though the power station behind me is running at full capacity, there's no smoke, there's no chimneys, there's no sign that it's running at all. As a matter of fact, this station is outputting zero carbon emissions. Like all of the nuclear power stations, when it's running at full capacity, it produces zero carbon emissions because there is no fuel being burnt and no emissions been released into the atmosphere. In fact, the only emissions given off from this plant is waste heat given off in the form of steam. As we look at the plant, we can also see that there are no pylons carrying cables to and from. To make this plant greener, all the cables to the power station were buried. The nearest pylon takes cables up from the ground over three kilometers away behind the hill and out of sight from the power station. And when we speak of the environment, it's also worth noting that the Scottish Environmental Protection Agency, the EPA, checked the air contamination in the area. They also checked the water contamination. They also check the milk from the cows, the fish in the sea, and ensure that no radiation has been leaked. So moving closer to the power station, this is where the cooling water from the sea enters underneath this bridge, and they estimate that roughly a billion cubic litres of water is pumped through down here every year to cool down the excess heat. So moving inside, unfortunately I wasn't allowed to take any videos or footage inside in the plant for security reasons, but I can tell you that from this control room in the centre of your screen is where two men, one for each reactor, operate the cauldron of radioactivity that's down underneath here. So how exactly does this produce the heat and the steam to generate electricity? Let's have a look and find out. Inside in the reactor itself, the uranium fuel, through the process of fission, produces a great amount of heat. The heat is cooled by a carbon dioxide gas, which is passed on into the secondary loop, where it boils water, which turns to steam, and hitting the turbines at a force of 165 bar, which is almost 2,500 psi, it drives the turbines and the shaft, which in turn are linked to the alternator, which produces the electricity for the national grid. The steam, as it condenses coming through the turbines, is cooled by inlet water from the sea, and the excess heat is pumped back out to sea, 4 to 5 degrees warmer. Okay, all of the reactors in Taurus are sealed behind a reinforced concrete wall like this. This is the size of the reinforcing, the whole way across. And each of the walls is six meters deep. That's three of me, one on top of another, on top of another. That's to withstand any blast or the heat, or the intense heat that can be produced. The power of the nuclear reactor comes from its uranium fuel cells, which come from a mine like this, and they're refined into tiny little pellets like this. Each of those pellets are stacked to form what's called a fuel cell, and this is one of those fuel cells. The fuel cells consist of uranium pellets stacked into a stainless steel bar, welded shut each end, and they're assembled together. Each power cell in the reactor consists of eight of these guys stacked one on top of each other like batteries going into your tape recorder or your torch. Each fuel cell is a little shorter than the width of my thumb. Each of these cells is packed into the stainless steel cylinder and the gas circulates through these and that allows the nuclear fission reaction to take place causing the heat which will then be used to generate the steam. So now we'll have a look at where the water rejoins the sea at the back of the power station, having done its job cooling down the plant. The water exit in these culverts is around about 6 degrees warmer than when it went in. This heat attracts plenty of fish to the area, and as we can see the local fishermen here have no worries about radiation or fish. They are very very happy to take their food from right outside the power station.